All right. So two kinds of problems in our skill here on the Arrhenius equation and activation energy, and then drawing and using reaction coordinates and thinking about transition state structures, okay? So computational problem and then more qualitative problem. And as we'll see, um, it's a way to sort of integrate our structure drawing again. Okay, so let's do this first problem with um, the Arrhenius equation. So I know this equation can look really scary. It's right here. But we've seen an equation like this before. We saw the clausius clapeyron equation, which looked very similar, except this was delta H of vaporization. And these were not rate constant ratios. They were ratios of pressures. So that was the clausius clapeyron equation. And we're going to see one more flavor of this equation, which now is not going to have rate constants. It will have equilibrium constants. So we'll see that in just a little bit here. The challenge with doing problems like this is often not seeing that this is the kind of problem that uses the Arrhenius equation, but it's usually how do I solve for the unknown? So the two problems that we're going to practice today both actually solve for the activation energy, which is the EA part. We'll see qualitatively what activation energy is when we look at a reaction energy diagram. But what you want to think about is if you've got reactants at a certain energy level and they're going to go and become products at a certain energy level, we always have an activation energy barrier. It's like the energy that you need to put in to get the reaction going. So that's always gonna be a positive value and it's the energy that it takes to get up and over a hill to the other side. And I think this will become more sort of um, uh, relevant and obvious when we draw a picture that actually shows that. So this is just sort of the calculation piece here. So the challenge is we're gonna be solving this equation for one of these unknowns. Our two problems today are gonna to calculate activation energy. Make sure that you uh, would recognize, well, how would I solve this if I were solving for the initial temperature or the final rate constant, right? Just solving for a different piece in that unknown um, uh, equation. So we're gonna treat these problems the same way that we treated problems like when we had uh, the clausius clapeyron equation or we were using changing variable problems with PV equals NRT, we want to list all our variables because that's the common place where students make mistakes is they don't put things in the right spots. So let's list all our pieces here. So we've got K1 and T1, K2 and T2. We're going to have our R value and then we are solving in this problem for our activation energy. So one of the things, and I've seen students do this on other problems, is we have to make sure we use the right R constant. Both of these R values are actually equivalent to one another, but because they have different units, we change the value of the number that's part of that value. And so this is the one we want to use because we're doing stuff with energy. If you're doing stuff with gas laws and you're talking about the liter, the pressure, the, the, the uh, volume, the pressure, the quantity, or the temperature of your gas, then this is the guy that you want to use. So both of those R values will be provided. Make sure you grab the right one. Okay, so units for your rate constant are not going to necessarily matter because they cancel out here, but make sure if you are solving a problem for a rate constant that you know what those units are so that you can put them back in at the end, okay? Activation energy is going to end up having units of joules per mole, so make sure to note if the problem is asking for activation energy in terms of kilojoules per mole. In this case, it's not specified. So once you look at your answer, see if it might make more sense to put it in units of kilojoules per mole. And as we see in this problem, that will be the case. Temperature must be in Kelvin, right? We're gonna know that because we've got R uh, having um, units in Kelvin. We, we are almost always going to need to put um, degrees into Kelvin in order to do math with them. And that's because it avoids negative temperature. Okay, now this problem already gave them in Kelvin, so we're good to go. So let's just kind of list everything that we have here. We've got 7.14 times 10 to the minus 9th for our first rate constant. That's at temperature of 275K. And noticing that Kelvin are the units that we want, so that's in the right units. Okay, uh, second rate constant is 6.90 times 10 to the minus 7th. And then that is at 480K. Again, those units are good to go. So I'm going to not put units in when I do my calculation just because we've pre-checked and all of our units are good. But I want to note something here that makes sense from a qualitative standpoint. 
we know that if we increase the temperature, that makes a reaction go faster. Faster reactions have larger rate constants. So as I go from, and I wrote 25K here, sorry about that, we need to write 275K. So let me go ahead and fix that here. I was talking and writing at the same time, 275K. As I go from a lower temperature to a higher temperature, my rate constant gets larger. Okay, so that is internally consistent with what we with what we would expect. Okay, we're not going to have a reaction that we make slower. That's one of those qualitative pieces that we learned about with kinetics. Reactions get faster when we heat them up. Rate constants are temperature dependent, as we're going to see in a little bit. Um, uh, equilibrium constants are also temperature dependent, and the Clausius-Clapeyron equation—that's the one that had pressures here. That reminds us that pressure is temperature dependent. Okay, so we're gonna see three versions of an equation that looks look like this. Okay, so let's go ahead and we're gonna put all of our math in here. Two places where students can make mistakes are not putting the right pieces in the right place, okay? And then also not doing your algebra properly. So I'm gonna kind of solve this in steps so we can make sure to see how you'll solve this. So I'm putting in my K values here, very important to put them in the right spots. And I, like I said, I'm gonna keep my units out of this just to keep my writing and my math simple here because we already checked all the units, everything's good to go. Okay, so here's how I would solve this uh, problem algebraically. Okay, I'm gonna figure out what this number is and that's gonna be 96. 0.6386, okay? And then I'm gonna figure out what this value is, okay? That's gonna be minus 0 0.0015530. So a couple of thoughts here as you're doing your math. Make sure that you don't round too early. Keep four to five significant figures until you get to the very end. A lot of times students just wanna like write 0.15. It's, you're going to be off by a little bit if you round too early. So do not do that, okay? Same thing here, I left a bunch of significant figures there, okay? Next thing that I would do to solve this is I'm gonna figure out what the natural log of that number is. So that's gonna be 7.0533, okay? And then uh, let's put my R value in, okay? Probably should have put that in here. Let's put that mathematically in there, 8.314. I'm gonna figure out what this math is it's gonna be minus E sub A, and when I multiply that by my negative temperature, okay, that ends up being positive. Your activation energy should be positive. If you get a negative value, you made a mistake someplace, put something in the wrong spot, okay? So mathematically, I'm going to have 4.00529 times 10 to the minus four, oh, I think it's minus four. I had to grab my calculator here. Let me just make sure, 0.001. Zero divided by eight point three one four. Yep. Uh, so point zero zero. Oops, I put. I was looking at my wrong problem. I apologize here. That's why I was getting confused. Oops. All right. Put this number in, and it's one point eight six seven nine seven. Sorry about that. I was looking at my next problem. Times ten to the minus fourth. Okay, so that's that problem's uh, math there. Now, I saw this on quizzes. People would subtract um, those numbers, okay? We have to divide. That's how I'm gonna isolate and have E sub A here. So E sub A is gonna be 24,470. Let's confirm what units are gonna be for this, okay? So I'm not gonna have any units on the left-hand side, but over on the right-hand side, if I see what I'm gonna have here, I've got one over joules per mole Kelvin, because that's my R value, times one over Kelvin. I had reciprocal temperature. Kelvin's gonna cancel, and I'm gonna have one over joules per mole. So I'm gonna have activation energy there. This is gonna be units of mole per joule over here. And so when I solve for E sub A, okay, I'm gonna end up having the reciprocal of those, which is going to have units of joules per mole. 
okay? Again, if the algebra is something that you're having a hard time seeing, make sure to come, come, come see me, practice lots of problems. Okay, let's convert this to kilojoules per mole, and let's go ahead and round to the three significant digits that we should have. Um, again, that 480, if we really considered it to be 480K with a decimal point there, it's not written, but let's assume that we've got three significant figures for all. This is gonna end up being 24.5 kilojoules per mole as our answer. Okay, conceptually, not a really hard problem. Uh, I can't remember if I said this already, but if you're having a hard time with problems, what, one of the things I would really encourage you to do, maybe start having some flashcards for this. Every time you do a homework problem, write the equation and the information that you needed to use to solve that homework problem. And then on the flip side, how do I know to use that equation or that information again? Because one of the things that's going to start getting more challenging, the more information we start having that's going to become part of our cumulative final exam, is how do I know that this information means to use this equation to get to my answer? So I'd encourage you, maybe flashcards is a way to sort of do that. Like, how do I know that that's gonna be the, the pathway that gets me to my answer? Okay, so calculation-based piece for the Arrhenius equation, solving for one of these pieces. Let me just say one thing real quick. If you had to solve for one of these pieces, okay, what you're gonna to need to do is take E to the both sides, because that's gonna allow you to isolate either K1 or K2 by itself, okay? I think you have a homework problem that asks you to practice that. Again, if you're solving for one of these guys by yourself, make sure you see the algebra for how you would solve for that. That often is kind of a sticking point for people. Um, you'll probably get you know, a good portion of points from partial credit if it's a problem with your algebra, but um, let's, let's make sure that we, that we fix that, fix that um, sticking point if it's something that you're struggling with. All right, next problem, qualitative problem. This is sort of a generic reaction that we're given and we're asked to draw a reaction energy diagram and calculate activation energy for the reverse process. Okay, guarantee you're going to have to do something with a reaction energy diagram on your next test. I'm gonna ask you to draw one. So here's the pieces that you need to have. Reaction energy diagrams basically look like a plot where we're plotting energy. And for the most part right now, we're focused on enthalpy. So we can write energy as enthalpy or you could write enthalpy there. And the x-axis is going to be reaction progress. All right, so that's how you set up making a reaction energy diagram. Sometimes I'll refer to them as reaction coordinates, okay? You have to label energy levels of your reactants and products. So if you have an exothermic reaction, negative delta H, that means your products are lower in energy than your reactants. Now another piece that's going to be important here is you're going to have to draw this roughly to scale. So if I'm looking at what I have here, I've got that the delta H of my reaction is 55 kilojoules per mole. It's an exothermic reaction. I should have said negative 55. It's neg negative 55, which means it's a downhill reaction. My activation energy is 215, so about four times as big. That means when I'm going, I'm basically going to have energy levels here for my reactants and products, and I have a hill that's about four times bigger to go up and over to the other side. That's what I need to draw. So I draw energy level for my reactants, and I'm gonna label what they are, A, B, and C, and then D, those are my reactants. I've got an energy level for my products. That's A, B, and then C, D. I know the value of this, this delta H value is minus 55 kilojoules per mole. I know the magnitude of the size of that arrow. It's 55 kilojoules, okay? So that's where I get that piece of information. Delta H of reaction there is the magnitude of that arrow, the size of that arrow, okay? And I know it's downhill because it's negative, okay? All right, now I need to go uphill four times as much. That's where my peak of my activation energy is. So activation energy is the energy level between 
my reactants, and then the hill that I go to. This hill we're going to call TS or transition state. We're gonna to get to another problem in just a second that allows us to think about that, okay? That's about four times the value. So this activation energy is four times, so it's minus or positive 215 kilojoules per mole. Activation energies are always higher. This is a hill that we have to go over. So it's always a positive value to get up and over, okay? So now what I do is I connect these. So I'm going to go up and over through the height of what I call my transition state and then down to the other side, okay? So that's how you draw a reaction energy coordinate. It has to have all of these pieces and it needs to be relatively to scale. We're gonna talk more about the transition state in our last problem here, but let's go ahead and answer the uh, second part here, which says to calculate the activation energy of the reverse process. So just to finish this up, let me highlight how we know we get these different pieces. I know the height of this arrow here. This is my activation energy. I know that from this piece, activation energy for the forward process. So activation energies are always the energy difference between the height of my hill, which we call the transition state, and something lower in energy that's on either side of it. If we're going from reactants through transition state, it's the activation energy for the forward process. If it's from product to transition state, that's the activation energy for the reverse process. So here's what I need to figure out. I need to know the activation energy for the reverse process. So this is activation energy for the reverse process. I should have gone through and labeled that this is activation energy for the forward process, okay? So like we did with lots of our Hess's law and our sort of imagining breaking things apart type things, okay? If I know the height of this arrow and then I also know the height of that arrow, the sum of those two will give me that value, okay? So to finish up this problem here, activation energy for the reverse process is going to be 215 plus 55, so that's going to be equal to 270 kilojoules per mole for the activation energy for the reverse process. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. What we're gonna do in another problem that we have to do with reaction coordinates is we're gonna talk about what molecules that are in the transition state look like. But before we do that, I wanna give you an opportunity to practice an Arrhenius equation problem on your own. So here it is. Okay, I'd encourage you to pause the video right now. Go ahead and write down the question. Go ahead and try to solve it. The answer you should get is 1.76 times 10 to the second kilojoules per mole. Okay, pause it, try to solve it yourself. Okay, I'm gonna to flip to the solution in just a minute. If you didn't get this solution, this is one of those sample problems that has a worked out video solution. So I'll walk through the algebra for you. <coughs> but pause it, try it yourself. In just a second, I'm gonna to flip to the worked out solution. All right, here's the worked out solution for this. Pause again if you need to fill in some places where maybe you didn't have something correct, but make sure you could work through a problem like this. Highlighting this again is another problem where we're solving for activation energy. Homework problems will allow you to solve for other things like temperature or one of the rate constants, okay? All right, last problem here to work through is another reaction energy diagram, but this time we're gonna spend most of the time focused on thinking about what the transition state looks like and drawing a structure for it. So I'm gonna go fairly quickly here through the first part of this, which is taking the information that's provided and drawing a reaction coordinate. Okay, so I'm gonna be quiet while I do it. Um, go ahead and maybe try drawing it yourself. It's just like that problem what we did. And uh, then we'll move on together with kind of the uh, new piece that we have there. trying as best as possible to draw it to scale.
very large negative delta H. So doing my best to draw it to scale, I know I didn't truly get it to scale because those are about, about 20 fold different. <coughs> Okay, so that pretty much gets me to the details of um, drawing my reaction energy diagram. Okay, here's my transition state. That's living at the top of the hill. Just like a ball can't really live at the top of a hill, it wants to roll to either side. Transition states represent species that don't exist, but as the name implies, it represents what a structure might look like it, as it transitions from reactants to products. So for the second part of this problem, we're going to do a little bit to review what it means to be um, either ozone or oxygen atoms. That's what O3 is, is ozone, or molecular oxygen, O2. So I'm going to zoom in over here so that we can see these different uh, species. So what we're going to have is we're going to have O3. We're going to have O. And I'm going to draw these as uh, different colors here so we can see them and then uh, O2. So let's draw what these different species look like. So this is a good opportunity to uh, imagine redrawing Lewis structures, okay? So if I were to draw oxygen, molecular oxygen, here's what it would look like, noting that we're going to have two of them, right? This is what we get as products. Our stoichiometer, or our, our, our equation was balanced. We started out with four oxygen atoms, kind of as three together as ozone and one as an atom of oxygen. And what's going to happen as we do this chemistry is I'm going to make a new bond between this oxygen and one of those oxygens of ozone, and it's going to break apart, and then I'm going to have one molecular oxygen and another molecular oxygen. So that's how that's going to happen, and we're going to use structure drawing to explain what that looks like. Okay. An atom of oxygen, hopefully everybody's good recognizing oxygen has six valence electrons, so that's what that guy looks like. Ozone might be a little bit more challenging, but we've got three oxygen atoms that are together. What's going to happen is one of those is going to have a zero formal charge. And then as we put in the rest of our electron glue, convince yourself that that's the right number of electrons. Everybody has a complete octet here. Make sure that you can see that. But our formal charges are such that adjacent oxygen atoms are going to have a plus one and a minus one formal charge. Now, we want to avoid that if possible, but we cannot fix anything with this Lewis structure. I can't take these electrons and have them be shared there. Even though we want to do that to make that oxygen have a formal charge of zero, sometimes when we had adjacent atoms that had opposite formal charges, that was an indication that somebody had a pair and needs to share. But we can't do that here, because if I take these electrons and make them as a bond there, Notice that then this oxygen atom would have 10 electrons around it. That's an octet violation. An oxygen cannot expand its octet. So this is the correct Lewis structure for ozone, O3. Okay, so remember what I said there? We've got four oxygen atoms. We start out, three of them bonded together as ozone and one of them as an individual oxygen atom. What's gonna happen is we transition from reactants to products is I'm gonna have a bond form between these two oxygen atoms and break between these two. So I need to show that with a molecular structure. So if I wanna think about what my transition state looks like, okay, so my transition state is going to look like this. I'm gonna have ozone that I have here, okay? And what I'm gonna be showing here is, I'm gonna show this with a gray bond here. I'm gonna have an a bond that's beginning to break between this oxygen atom, okay? And then beginning to form with this oxygen atom. Okay, so this bond is breaking and this bond is forming. And what that's going to give us is it's going to give us one molecule of oxygen here and then a second molecule of oxygen here. <coughs> okay, 
So you may need to incorporate some structure drawing information, okay? What does a transition state structure look like? A transition state structure, like the name implies, is a structure that's transitioning from our reactants to our products. So we wanna show bonds that are breaking and bonds as are forming. I know this looks like we're drawing hydrogen bonds or something, but this is a formalism for how we can draw bonds that are breaking or forming. And again, we need to be able to label which ones are breaking and which ones are forming, okay? So two kinds of problems that we have here in this skill on activation energy and the Arrhenius equation, so computational, and then reaction coordinates and transition states um, with a more qualitative piece. All right, and that's it for this skill.